Okay, um... So we can uh, start, uh, I apologize for the uh, <laughs> extremely long and not particularly good answer to a good question but uh, on Tuesday, but uh, since it didn't seem like too many other questions were going to be coming my way, I guess I was just burning, burning time and so I apologize a little bit for that. I'm not even quite sure at the end of the lecture whether I was uh, telling you anything um, correct. So. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, Tuesday was kind of a light, a light day. We didn't make a lot of progress. But uh, if there were any outstanding questions about flash calculations, k-values, and things, I'll try to be more, um, more um, short-winded on giving an answer. So before we move on, if there's any questions, you can, you can start. We'll start um, letting you do that. So again, I apologize for. Um, just out of curiosity, when people did the flash calculations in the Rashford Rice solution, did anyone find that you, um, when you're searching for the vapor fraction, I think it's called FG or BAID, I don't remember the term in the book, FG? Is that? Huh? FV. Uh, when you solve for that, did anybody put in a pressure or something where that FV? was outside the limits of zero to one. I mean, the physical limits of zero to one. Zero, FV of zero is what? What does that represent? Huh? A bubble point. And FV of one represents a? A dew point. So, um, and in between you've got two phases of, but if, did anybody calculate at a pressure where the FV that it solved the Ratchford rice problem actually ended up with a value less than zero or greater than one. So um, <clears throat> what, you, what you'll find out if you want to go back and, and, and look at this, if you, if you had any interest in the Tuesday <laughs> discussions on the convergence pressure and things that I was talking about, which you probably don't, but if you do, you can just go into your Ratchford rice program and put a pressure above the bubble point, okay? Just put it in there and solve the flash calculation at a pressure above the bubble point. Because if you put the, the bubble point pressure in at, at the reservoir temperature, it'll solve for F of V equal to zero. But if you go a little above that, your, your algorithm should solve for an F of V less than zero minus point six eight at some pressure. And if you go to higher pressure, it'll go to a FV of minus six point eight. And as you choose the pressure higher and higher, approaching the convergence pressure, if you go to the convergence pressure, well it'll stop it'll stop converging before you get there. But as you approach the pressure approaches the convergence pressure, the FV will go from 0 to minus 0.1 to minus 1 to minus 5 to minus 10, and it'll actually approach minus infinity as, you, as that pressure approaches the convergence pressure. Okay? And you're calculating um, and it'll give you an equilibrium composition X and an equilibrium composition Y. They sum to one. Those two compositions are in equilibrium with each other. But you have a negative amount of one phase and you have a more than one mole <laughs> fraction of the other phase. So physically, it's single phase, but this calculation will keep going and giving you two compositions. And those two compositions will get closer and closer to each other. Okay, so it's just a fun kind of mathematical exercise, um, and the um, so. But the point is that the flash calculation pressure, if you're using the convergence pressure method, you can only get a solution at pressures less than the convergence pressure. Okay, you can't get solutions 
that pressure is beyond or higher than the convergence pressure. And of course, the only pressure you're interested in, the highest pressure you're interested in physically, is the upper saturation pressure, it could be at a bubble point or a dew point. But, but the, um, the algorithm, <clears throat> when you solve for the vapor fraction, how many put vapor fraction bounds in the solver? Did you, you put bounds. What bounds did you put? Zero. Okay. So you're cutting, you're cutting off the possibility to do the so-called negative flash calculation. And that's because of this intuitive, it's not physical outside of that. Okay? This is going to be one of those technological, philosophical comments. What you did is what I and everybody else in the industry did, literally, they cut it off from zero to one in this solution because it was the physical bound. There's a guy named Aaron Zick who um, also made some other discoveries because he realized there was no reason to stop at the physical bound. The mathematical problem could be solved for vapor fractions outside zero to one. And actually you could interpret the results of those negative flash calculations physically, okay? Because if in fact you did the flash calculation and let it go to minus infinity to plus infinity, it basically shouldn't be bounds. If you did that and you solved just above the bubble point and you got minus one, okay? It'll give you an equilibrium gas and oil composition, okay? Now the thing is that if you went to the laboratory and said, make up a mixture of either the gas or the oil or some mixture in between in the laboratory, what you'd find is that that would be a physical equilibrium system. So any composition between X, I, and Y that you calculated from, okay, would physically mix together and it would always, it would be on a tie line, okay? So it's creating these tie lines but from the single phase region. It's weird, okay? So this guy said, well, you know, mathematically, the only thing physical required is that the compositions themselves are all positive. You can't have a negative component amount composition, okay? Um, so you basically let, you let the program solve the Rashford rice unbounded in vapor fraction. And it ends up that that leads to a lot of interesting numerically more efficient algorithms and, and some interesting theoretical things. Um, uh, the point being that when you solve a mathematical problem, you have to be very careful to bound the solution of that problem with your physical intuition, okay? You want to solve the mathematical problem and then look at the result and say, is it a physical result? And it's one of the biggest problems people, ha technologists, scientists have, is that they throw their, 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 their intuitive physical understanding, maybe it's even a correct physical understanding, and if you throw those physical bounds onto the solution of what's really a mathematical problem, you can often lose a big solution space of interest. So, so take away those bounds, all right, on the vapor fraction. But again, you're doing the same thing I and literally everybody else in the, wor in, the, in the world was doing except this one guy. And then once it was published and people said, oh, yeah, we don't have to do that, then everything became actually better because of that. So anyway, it's just kind of a comment. Okay. Um, so the next topic uh, on our list... Um, which I guess we can look at um, from the course syllabus is, um, well, there's no real order, but if we stick with the order given here, uh, we've kind of gone through this more or less in the same order. Flash calculation, we've got PVT experiments and Blackwell PVT model, and then towards the end we get into to, uh, more reservoir engineering stuff. So we've got the PVT experiments and the Blackwell PVT model. These are the next two major subjects uh, on the agenda. Uh, PVT experiments is chapter six. 
and Blackwell Properties is Chapter 7. So those are kind of the next two sets of reading. Um, now, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so let's um, kind of, uh, this is not, this is not good. Pen's not working. There it is. Okay. Um, so we're going to get into uh, laboratory PVT tests, experiments. which is chapter six. And <clears throat> and the purpose of those experiments are to, to measure physical properties of our particular reservoir fluid or fluids, okay? Density, viscosity, equilibrium compositions, bubble point, dew point. Um, what else have we talked about as, as important properties for engineering calculations? You know, pressure drop, viscosity, density comes in the Reynolds number. Uh, calculating gravitational flow, you need to know the density of both phases. Um, compositions are important for designing separator test optimization to get the most out of, out of what we produce. Um, flash calculations, uh, bubble point, dew point, they tell us what? what? What kind of reservoir fluid we have? Reservoir gas, reservoir oil. In Norway, it doesn't really matter, okay? But in Saudi Arabia and, and UAE, then it does matter. Who owns what? So, so these are the physical properties that we kind of need. And so this is going to talk about kind of how do we measure those properties, okay? So that's going to be um, this topic. Now, before you make a measurement, what do you have to do? Huh? We have to collect a sample of the stuff in the reservoir, or at least something that we think is in the reservoir, okay? So the first thing that you have to do is to sample reservoir fluids. Okay. Without the samples, we can't do our PVT lab tests. So sampling, in a sense, is really the next topic. We have to talk, we have to talk a little bit about how do we get those samples. We can do it in the short, in the short version or the long version. Um, in fact, there's on the famous YouTube site, <laughs> There, there's actually three videos on sampling, which I don't know if they're good or bad. I haven't listened to them in a while, but, but they do talk about the whole issue of taking samples, good or bad. One of the problems in telling about how do we sample fluids is that there's not a book, there's not a publication or an article that I can send you to and say that read this and you'll know about sampling. Unfortunately, it's just it's not out there, okay? Uh, so... At the same time, for every new field, there's always some poor engineer that has to design the sampling program, okay? And what they usually do is they go back to the last guy or the last girl who had the job, and they do the same thing they did without really knowing or understanding why they did it, okay? And it's, there's a budget for it, so they don't even have to argue for the budget, so they just do it, and they just kind of use up the budget. They order a bunch of samples without really thinking or knowing what samples do I need to get the data, the, the measurements I need, okay? And there's a lot of money wasted in, in sampling unnecessarily, and in part it's the industry who hasn't provided really kind of practical good guidelines about what and how you should sample. How you should sample the, the service companies, Schlumberger, Halliburton, will, they'll do it for you, Weatherford. Okay, so you don't really know, have to know too much about the how of sampling. But which kinds of samples, how many samples, uh, samples for this well or that well or both wells, those kind of questions just aren't dealt with in any literature. 
So what I tell you, or what's on the video, is, is, is like my best shot at get, giving you some good advice, okay? Generally speaking, people take too many samples and maybe samples of their own type, but um, we need to start there, getting samples of reservoir fluids. Um, once we've done that, then we can, we can go into, basically this is, then we can go in and talk about the, the laboratory PVT experiments, okay? Um, now, there is nothing in the book about sampling, okay? And like I said, I can't send you to an article about it. So we need to do some short summary of sampling before we go forward. Like I said, there's a three video series on the YouTube if you want more detail. And if you search Google search sampling, petroleum, oil and gas sampling, you'll probably get the service companies will show you pictures of how the sampler methods work. Uh, probably, I don't know, nice, you know, Hollywood like pictures that are more interesting. But, but um, so, so I'm going to give you kind of a short a short review of the of the sampling issues that you need to um, probably be aware of. The first thing is that we've got basically three types of samples. So we've got the, the types of samples, of sampling methods, let's call it. Okay. And as I've written here, I'm talking about getting samples of what we think is actually in the reservoir, or at least it came out of the reservoir, all right? <laughs> okay? Um, and it represents a mixture that came out of the reservoir and, and not a bunch of stuff that we, chemicals that we put into the reservoir, which is not like it's only locally around the well bore, okay? So if we're drilling the well, the drilling engineers here, they'll want to use some what's called oil-based mud. This is an oil that is like not what's in the reservoir, okay? And there's not going to be a lot of it, but it's going to be like around around the well bore because that you want invasion of that into the formation a few feet out so that the well doesn't blow out while they're drilling it, okay? That's what happens. And the thing is that that oil in oil-based mud is not what's in the reservoir. So if you get samples of the oil-based mud, it's like giving you the wrong properties, okay? So you don't want to use those samples to get our physical properties because they're not going to be representative. So you either have to clean out all of that oil-based mud before you take samples. That's one way to do it. Or, yeah, so, so the thing is that we basically have two types of reservoir fluids. We've got what's in situ initially in place. In situ means initially in, in the reservoir in place in the reservoir, okay? And you've got fluids that came out of the reservoir, but without this contamination, okay? Just basically produced reservoir fluids. But without chemicals that we put into the reservoir, okay? So whatever came out, maybe it didn't come out in the right proportion to what's actually in the reservoir. You know, maybe there's some gas and some oil and the gas flows easier, easier than the oil so you get more gas than you, you should have in the sample. So it's, it's not really in situ representative, but it did come out of the reservoir. And I'm just gonna basically say it is not contaminated. Contaminated. That's one type. And then sometimes you've got produced reservoir which are contaminated, okay? And we can use both kinds of samples. We can use both kinds of samples, but for different reasons, in different ways, okay? So there's, there's three types of, of sampling methods that we're going to talk about. The first one is what's called open hole. This is the most common today. I'm going in reverse chronological order. This is the most recent method of, of sampling. Um, the first version of this came out around 1980. 
late 70s. But it's called an open hole formation tester. And the first version of this was called the repeat formation tester, and this was about 1980. Probably a little before that, but uh, not around 1980. And that was a Schlumberger product. And then you, and then you got today, which is the today's version of that. I don't know when that came out. 1990, 95, 2000. And, you know, time goes. I have no idea when this came out, but it was probably after 1990, I suspect. And it's continuously developing, but they keep the same name. Everybody knows MDT. That's the Schlumberger version. You have something called RCI. It's the equivalent for one of the other companies. I don't know which company it is. And then you've got another one, the third company. They, they, okay. But they're open hole formation testers. And so this is a sample that is taken before setting pipe. Does everybody know what setting pipe means? Casing. Putting a big pipe in the big hole you just drilled, cementing the pipe to the formation, okay, and then shooting holes through the pipe so that fluids can come into the wellbore. That's, that's like a cased well, okay? So before, what we call it, before setting pipe, we're taking the samples. So it's this open hole that the drillers provided for us. Okay? Probably with oil-based mud inside it. Sometimes they use water-based mud, in which case there's not a contamination problem. I don't know why they use water-based mud and why they use oil-based mud. They use more and more oil-based mud. It's either cheaper or easier to keep the well from blowing out. I don't really know. But you could have either. But there's going to be mud in the well. Okay? There's going to be no pipe. And like you send a tool down, and what this tool does, I'm going to try to make a picture of this, is that this is one side of, uh, I'll draw the, I always make such an ugly picture of this. This is the, this is the rock out here. That's the hole that we just drilled. Um, and so you send this thing on a wire line, okay? And it's a, it's a big old tool because it does all sorts of stuff. So it's a big old tool like this. I don't know exactly how big it is, but something like that. And it's like a little laboratory inside it. I mean, it's just incredible kind of equipment they have inside it. They've got pumps, okay, and, and uh, all sorts of electronics. But basically, this tool has what I call a nose connected to it. It's kind of a little conduit. And then you've got to push this nose up against the formation, and you do that with a spring or something, maybe a couple of springs. I don't know how they do it. Not like this, but... Okay, the point is that you're pushing from one side, you push the nose up against the formation, and then this becomes a small production test. You're actually going to produce the well, just in small volumes. And you're going to produce the well from probably just a few meters outwards, but from all around the whole well bore, you're going to get fluids from this side flowing around to the other side and, and coming in here, kind of like that. And you're getting all sorts of flow lines trying to enter this limited, less than one inch, about like this, nose stuck up against the wall. And you've got a pump connected to this, and it pumps the fluids. And basically, it's got a conduit here that it pumps the fluids, and then it pumps it out into the mud. This is the well. OK? So it just starts pumping. It's a little production test. You get reservoir fluids out, pumped, and then it throws that fluid into the mud. Okay? And then along the way, it's got all sorts of measurements it's making. Resistivity, density, I don't know what. All sorts of measurements it's making with electronics. Maybe it's even got visual. And you can identify, maybe, when you're producing, instead of this, maybe this this mud, initially you'll just get the mud filtrate, okay? The mud filtrate is what's right around the well, be it water or oil-based mud. That's what you're going to produce the first minutes, or maybe even the first 
you know, 20 minutes. But then finally, your reservoir fluid is going to sneak through. This is kind of like the region of, of uh, filtrate out to here. Let's say we've got filtrate kind of out to here. And then I'm going to say it's a, it's, a, it's a gas reservoir just for some reason. So we've got gas out here. And so finally, the first streamline of gas, the shortest path is going to be that. So the gas right here is going to be the first gas that enters the tool. And 10 minutes later, you'll get gas coming from a, a line of flow that went from here because it takes longer. It's a longer path. And then you'll get some gas from over here at the end of four hours. It'll make its way around the well bore and get in here, okay? So at different times, you're getting more and more streamlines into this small nose that are filled with reservoir fluid and not mud filtrate, okay? And within an hour, hopefully, you're getting primarily reservoir fluid and less filtrate within an hour. And after four hours, which is typically when they take the sample, you're getting anywhere from 80 to 98% reservoir fluid and the rest is this filtrate okay so I'll just sketch for you that basically you're getting the percentage of the produced fluid that is mud filtrate we want that to go to zero right and it starts at 100% because that's what's around the well bore. Maybe not 100%, but it's going to go. And this is we're going to set somewhere around four hours. I think that's, you might get six hours, but then your boss is going to want to fire you because that two extra hours is like your, your like month salary. So <laughs> cheaper to fire you than to, to expect you to go six hours. So this thing should look something like this. It might go down towards that, which is like 10 12% uh, or it might if you're unlucky it might take longer to go out like that and then uh, if you're lucky it might go down like that okay and there's some new tools which I'm not going to talk about it's too detailed there's some new versions of the tool that actually let you get a sample that supposedly it, it, it goes like this Okay, this is a new, a new dual pump method, and the Schlumberger branding is called Spitfire. No, not Spitfire. That's a little too exciting. It's called. Anybody know? It's called uh, something like Spitfire. Uh, I'll think of it later. But basically, they use two pumps. So they take this nose. This nose here, I'm going to enlarge the nose. And they have a small nose inside, and then they have a packer, kind of a seal, that seals off the small nose. Okay, so they're basically pumping this area and this area separately. Okay? So they've got two pumps. So basically what you get is that the innermost pump is getting this stuff that's more directly here and that comes in quickly I didn't draw this very very nicely because that should be in the center of the nose so let me make the nose bigger that should be coming into the middle of the nose so those those lines that come in here they go into the center one and then all the oil based filtrate is pumped into the second region okay I don't know if you can see it, what's going on, but you, you basically suck in fluids at two points, and the inner point is getting fluids in a more limited set of, 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 of flow lines that's more directly coupled to the reservoir. So that's, that's this new dual pump uh, method. So you can sample, for example, at an earlier time and still not have much contamination after two hours. Save a bunch of money. The tool costs more, but you save time. Don't you know the name of the sampler? No. No. We'll think of it here in a second. Okay. So it's actually a local at a specific depth 
You're not going to get fluids from more than about, you know, half a meter above and below, plus minus one meter, okay? Local production test. Okay? And what we sample is reservoir fluid plus some mud filtrate. So if the oil-based mud is water-based, then you're basically sampling the initial in-situ reservoir fluid. So it's a very good way to get samples of what's at that particular depth. You actually get the composition of this in-situ fluid, okay? If it's water-based mud. If it's oil-based mud, you're getting some contaminated version of that. Any questions about this? This is the, this is kind of, and then what they do is they'll, they'll do these measurements, maybe spend six hours, you know, they'll measure pressures as well and temperatures and so forth, and then they'll just lower this thing or raise this thing to another depth and do the same thing. So they might have four or five or six depths where they get samples, they get pressures, and or both, okay? They don't know, but they'll tell you they know. Okay, but generally speaking, they're they're within four hours. Experience shows that within four hours, then the traditional original with a single pump, they're typically in a contamination level that's, you know, probably five to forty percent within four hours, and with the new dual pump, within four hours, they're probably down between, you know, a fraction of a percent to to ten percent. It's just experience. They do make measurements like resistivity. Um, so like if it's a water-based mud and it's a resistivity measurement, then clearly the initial resistivity with water is going to be what? High or low? Yeah, so it'll be low. And then as the oil starts coming in, the resistivity goes up. Is that right? So you'll see this clear shift in the resistivity that will reflect how much hydrocarbon versus water you're producing. If you have oil filtrate, then there's other things. They'll tell you how the methane content or the, they, they have, it's like a laboratory down in this tool. Okay. It's one reason you don't want to lose the tool in the well. Because <laughs> I don't know who pays for it, but it's a big, it's an expensive tool to lose. Okay. So they have indicators of how much relative mud is left in the sample, but not a not a very quantitative. It's only after they take the sample to the laboratory, they measure, they see how much contamination was there. And before taking this sample, uh, all the fluid is thrown out into the well? It's thrown into the well bore. That's right. This is just a bunch of mud. And now it's mud plus smaller volumes of reservoir fluid. And that's okay. It's not big volumes. So, so if, if you have water-based mud, then, the, then the, the reservoir fluid sample is very, very close to being exactly what you have in situ at that particular depth. We know exactly what Mother Nature put at that depth, at that location. The composition of it, we know it's, if it's a bubble point or dew point, we can measure in the laboratory. We basically know something about the true in situ initial reservoir fluid at that depth, okay? If it's oil-based mud, depending on the contamination level, we basically will have this reservoir fluid
example, that's equal to some in situ fluid plus the mud, the, the oil based stuff. Okay, the 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 mud or oil mud, as you could call it. Plus the oil mud. Okay, it, it's it's just an oil. Okay, it's not. I don't think it feels like a mud. I, I'm not sure. Maybe it does. But but you'll get this this material that's that's no longer the in situ fluid. So. And the, and the range of the percentage here can be anywhere from 0 0.x percent to 20 or more percent. For example, on a weight basis or a molar basis. On a weight basis, usually it's given in a, on a weight basis. Okay, so it could be significant. So it's not. It's just like it's not your reservoir fluid in situ. 20 could probably be 40, but. Uh, so what do we do in this case? Well, what we can do is that we, we don't usually use samples, these kind of samples, for lab PVT measurements. unless two reasons. One, if the percentage of oil-based mud is l very low, I'm going to say, let's say, less than 1%. Okay. Or, two, you don't have any better samples. Okay, you don't have any samples that are not contaminated. So if there's no samples that are not contaminated. From the other two methods we're going to talk about. Okay? The other two methods we're going to talk about, they don't have this oil-based mud problem. However, in some environments particularly the Gulf of Mexico and other high permeability environments, the, the production well, if they find oil and gas, they know the permeability is high. They don't need to know how high, they just know it's high. So they don't have to do a production test. They don't have to put pipe and perforate the pipe, have a production facility on the surface, spend another 20 days with the rig. They can save a lot of money by just walking away knowing that they've got oil or gas. Okay? That's all they need to know. So if they don't run a production test, put pipe and everything in it, then you won't have the only samples you'll have may be contaminated. Well, it's better to measure some properties than no properties. So that's the second situation that you could actually use the samples for lab PVT measurements. But in general, we don't use them except for those two cases. Okay? But what we will do, we'll always make a mathematical decontamination To get, and it's usually a very accurate estimate of the in situ reservoir fluid composition. Which I'm going to write Z R I. That's what we want. That's our in situ reservoir composition. And we're going to get an estimate for that.
and it's, and it's a fairly simple mathematical calculation, okay? And that's because the actual, uh, the actual sample composition, MDT, RCI, whatever they're called, okay? The actual sample composition is just the, ad, it's adding two other compositions. The one is the oil-based mud, so it's some amount, fraction of oil-based mud. So that could be, you know, the weight percent oil-based mud times the composition of the oil-based mud, okay, plus the fraction that is not oil-based mud, which is just the same number, one minus the same number, times the composition that we're really interested in, okay? This one here. That's our in situ reservoir fluid composition. So we have the analysis of that from the laboratory. We make a measurement of that. That's known. The people who sell us the oil-based mud will give us the composition of that mud. Okay? So we know that. And so you can back calculate ZRI by assuming the value of this how much is oil-based mud? Okay. So, so how do you find this right value? Okay. How do you find that value? No, there's a bunch of equations because for every component, we're solving this for every component I. That's right. So you have to assume oil-based mud fraction. We can assume zero, or we can assume 5% or 20%. Okay. So we're going to have to iterate. Where I'm going to show you how they find that. But if you know this oil-based mud amount, then you can solve directly, right? Just, you just rearrange the equation. Okay. So what they do is the following. They take, there's a person in the laboratory or somebody, this is like molecular weight or, you know, your carbon number I. We start at C7. And we plot, for example, since we measure weight percent in the, in the, in the laboratory, the weight percent of each of the components, the heavy components. Okay. Now, There's two types of oil-based mud, okay? There's two types of oil-based mud. It'll be one of two. It'll either be, this is again weight percent, this is for the oil-based mud alone. It'll either be type A, which is basically This is a gas, gas chromatography. So you've got, I think it's usually C19 and C21 or something like that. Okay, I call it the, the fang, <laughs> oil based metal. It looks like a fang upside down. You know, a fang is two teeth that, yeah. So it looks like that. That's one type. Okay. And then there's another type, which I'll do in, 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 I don't know, maybe in dark blue. And that type is is more like, like this. So that's type 2 and type 1. It'll be one of the two, okay? Let's say it's type 1, the fang. 
Okay. So what we do is that we plot, it can be weight percent or mole percent, it doesn't really matter. Okay, I'll, I'll plot this. So what we're going to do is that we're going to we're going to plot uh, the Z R I estimate for a given assumption of oil-based mud content. Okay, so if I assume zero, then from this equation, it's simply going to be plotting uh, Z S I, right? Because if you say that F oil-based mud is zero. Um, then that term disappears and that one so that basically these are equal. So I'm going to plot just in purple. So that's simply plotting the Z sample composition. Okay? And it's going to look something like this. This is probably on a log scale. The way I'm going to draw it, it's going to be on a log scale. something like that. I'm plotting this on a log scale. Okay, so you see what's going on. You've got this trend and you've got the two the two fangs. Okay? If I now take a guess at oil-based mud of 50%, which is, Curtis says is like off the charts, it's like, it's going to probably less than that. What will we get? What we'll get is something that falls basically like this. Okay. We've put too, we, we've assumed too much. So when we back calculate, we're, we're sucking out too much of those components. Okay? So it'll look like that. So you guys get the point. The one that's correct will just look like Like that. So we've got that one correct and that one correct. So you basically want to get those components that are in the oil based mud to not give a hump or a dump, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you don't want a mountain or a valley. You want to get rid of the discontinuity. Okay? And that's the amount that's the correct amount. Okay? And that can be done with a fairly high degree of precision, so that what you end up with, this one here, will actually lead to a very good, the ZRI estimate is going to be very good. Okay? Well, on trend. On trend. It doesn't have to be a straight line, but it'll be, it won't be erratically, you know, it's not going to be doing this in those components. So on trend. You want to bring all those components in the oil-based mud kind of where you don't see any inflection, uh, hump or or dump. That's basically the the way it's done. And with that we can end up getting a good a good estimate of that. Regardless almost how much contamination you have. Okay? So even if it's 20% contamination, you don't want to make PVT measurements on it because you know the bubble point is going to be wrong, dew point could be the GR is going to be wrong. Everything is going to be wrong on the PVT properties, but we can back calculate a very good estimate of that initial in situ reservoir fluid composition. That can be very helpful.
even if we don't make measurements of the properties of that of that mixture. Okay. So that's um, okay. So we'll.